Welcome to World Builders Anonymous. Kick that world building addiction and actually finish that novel with your hosts, Vito and John. The record button has been pressed. Oh, I forgot to mute everything else. <laughs> you do that every time. That's not how my song goes. <laughs> I know, I'm not thinking. <laughs> but do is you it? pay attention. <laughs> you gotta include the triplets too. The <laughs> I messed it up. Whatever. Okay, so you messed up your own song. I you messed up my me. own song. <laughs> I actually recorded that a while ago for a completely different project and oh, just really? found it again. And I was like, oh. oh. Because I never ended up getting used for that project, and I was like, "Oh, okay, I can just." I was this in, out. I was entirely under the impression that you were like on the fly were like, "Oh, I'll just make this super perfect intro for this thing." Oh no, definitely not. I've been lied to. <laughs> I mean, I oh. did. I, I spent like only two days on that. It, it was still like kind of a rough version of it. I, know, I just spent two days on this thing. It's not even like good or anything <laughs> like that. <laughs> Shut up. Oh boy, I will, I, we should definitely record a different a different tune at some point for. Uh, I can for be a intro. part of it. Yeah, I exactly. Have yeah, skills. We gotta learn that dad gad guitar, man. I, I have mine at open guitar. C right now. Well, that's very. Does that count? Um, um, what is happening? Whatever that what? song is, I think it's. What is um, happening? Whatever that I is, don't. it Justin Timberlake. I don't, I don't know. What is going on? I'm just singing stuff. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> anyway, welcome to the podcast, <laughs> everybody. Oh, I clipped. I'm going to try that again. Welcome to the podcast, everyone. There we Tone go. Tone it down. No, no Tone clipping. it down. I'm not going to shout anymore. I turned my gate up a little bit, and I'm, I'm getting too excited. <laughs> so well, it's an exciting show we have. The, so it is. It's a very exciting it. show. I was telling John before this, I, I just opened a can of La Croix. And um, I, I should have saved the popping of the tab for the intro. That would have made a good intro. But now you'll just have to settle for me drinking it. Which is <sighs> entirely less satisfying. That was very satisfying for me, actually. I don't know about you well, guys. I'm sure. <laughs> I went to a, uh, a birthday party with my in-laws. And they, the, the family who was having the party was like kind of a health nut kind of family. And they had like the Croy. I will use the proper name, the Croy, because <laughs> it's from the Midwest. Um <laughs> And they had a bunch of them like iced on the ta- like on the table, and I grabbed one. I'm like, "Oh, this is great!" And I was drinking it, and the, my in laws all looked at me like I was insane. <laughs> like, Just what drinking are you straight, doing? Drinking yeah. straight sparkle water. Yeah, I, my wife Tessa in particular finds it unbelievable that I would do something <laughs> like that, which really? I think is pretty fun. Yeah. Wow. She d- she doesn't like it at all. <laughs> interesting. We use it mostly for like a mixer. Right, for stuff, but I, I'll I'll just drink one straight every once in a while. It's it's a nice little. Uh, you feel like you're drinking something more than water, you know. But it's but that's it's exactly it. That's no exactly it. I hate I hate drinking water, <laughs> like just straight up. Even at work, I have like flavored packets in my desk. So if I get some water, I'll put one in there because I can't. I hate drinking water. Well, you want your drinking to be entertaining, and water's just not exactly very entertaining. You know, you know it's like, oh, I'm doing something right now. Yeah, you know, work like, can you know. work can be monot- uh, monot- monotonous, monogamous that's it, right? too. That's hopefully. Yeah. Well, typically it it is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what that means. <laughs> that was a long time to take a drink. <laughs> But like you don't want you want to spice up work in any way you can, so you know, drink some orange flavored water. It's better. <laughs> yeah, totally. I don't know how we got here, but here we are. Yeah, I I, I play in an Irish band. I I'm not drinking water at work. That's, that's sure. fair. <laughs> yeah, anyway. actually, my my the company I work for is originally uh, European, and so yeah, like there's beer on tap at work, and really beer fridges everywhere, and there's a wine cooler. Yeah, what? It's weird. It it it's very strange to me. That's pretty cool. That, uh, too bad you don't drink. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> It'd be great. But alas. Alas. Anyway, <laughs> two hours later. And so when I was 10 years old, my mom said, no, Whoa, no, <laughs> what? <laughs> we were just like bantering for like two hours straight, you know. That was a very strange thing to say. 
Was it? Oh, drat. I don't know where that out. came from. I don't know. I was just trying to come up with something that we let's jump like into the ten, topic. Tendentially, like arrived at two oh. hours later through talking. Oh, sure. Anyway, <laughs> we do have things to talk about today. Oh, that's what you. Okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> 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 he was so confused there for a second. Anyway, we do have things to talk about today uh, related to writing and world building. Believe it or not, we're um, only five Somehow. minutes in. Somehow. Um, Jeez. <laughs> this week uh, we are continuing our series on everything you need to know for your first draft. It's more like writing tips, as we said last week. It's more like us just talking about things because we don't know everything there is to know but we try <laughs> yes uh this week was john's week to research and he chose swords as his research topic keep by popular the... request and by oh, popular really? request i mean one guy on facebook said why are you talking about bows swords are cooler <laughs> so here we are <laughs> okay here we go then yeah great thanks, <laughs> thanks guy oh thanks, thanks guy on facebook thanks dude who i will not name <laughs> mostly because i don't remember your name <laughs> Mostly, I don't, not completely. Not entirely. It's part of the reason, but <laughs> cool. So, what has your research turned up, John? I will, I will be asking some more specific questions in a bit, but first, give us the the overview. What what we yes. need to know about swords in order to include them in our first drafts? Okay, so uh, the first thing is there are a ton of different kinds of swords, and they all have very specific names and. There's no way to cover them comprehensively in the kind of format that we do here. So it's not the goal. So, you know, we're going to not talk about so a whole lot out, of specific swords. Yeah, if we leave out your favorite, you know, style of Scottish Highland broadsword basketball. Why didn't you whatever. talk about the Turkish Yatanga? Yeah. Because well, no one cares. <laughs> Except potentially the Turks. <laughs> but whatever. <laughs> whatever. There's only one person who's listened to us in Turkey so far, so we don't think they're going to be you know what? too concerned. If, maybe if you up your listenership, you might get a shout out to your sword. Okay. Yeah. Turkey. Come on. Come on, Turkey. Step up your game. <laughs> Oh, boy. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> so uh, the goal here is to sort of guide your – maybe even guide your research towards the kind of swords that you're going to want. Because ultimately – okay, here's the thing. Every sword that's existed in history has existed for a very specific reason. And those reasons are probably not going to play themselves out exactly in your world. So it doesn't really make sense to copy – any super specific sword to your world. So the kind of thing I'm going for here is informing the decisions you make about your sword, whatever you call it. You might even just call it a sword, but the, when you describe it, you know, what are you describing? That's kind of what I'm trying to inform here. Is it like a claymore where it's this giant, you know, two-handed long, not, well, technically a long sword, I guess, more of a great sword. Is it a rapier as like a short Xiphos or is it a, like a, you know, Eastern Dow? Like, what is it? What does it's it look like? It's in a lot like? of words I don't understand right now. What about the Copus? Do you know what the Copus is? I have heard of that, actually. How about the Kapinga? Hmm? No, no, never heard of that. Okay. Anyway. <laughs> so there's two primary factors that I want to talk about that determine what your sword is probably going to look like. And the first one <clears throat> is pretty obvious, but it has a few more implications than you might think. And the, that is armor. Okay. So think of it like a chess game. Uh, your armor is actually the first move. The armor in your world is the first move of the chess game, and your and the counter move is the sword. So whatever armor exists, the sword exists to exploit the weaknesses of that armor. So you might have seen movies, and uh, Lord of the Rings is sadly guilty of this. Uh, the Gondorian like warriors in, in in Lord of the Rings have this like super cool you know steel plate armor that. No, looks awesome, and when they go to fight these like pretty much unarmored orcs, they get cut down by them like <laughs> unceasingly, which is very strange to me. Um, there's a couple scenes where like they get beat over with hammers, which is pretty pretty accurate because that's one of the the easiest ways to beat plate armor. But there are a lot of orcs slashing, and you know Gondorian soldiers go down. You'll basically see like a uh, an orc like swing a sword, and like the the Gondorian will like go the like very, very, very stage divey like. Blah! Yeah, right. You know, like uh, which, the cross is armored like midsection yeah, or something, you know. Which in the history of the world, I'm confident to say has never happened. <laughs> <laughs> because plate armor is crazy strong. It's crazy good. Like the steel plate armor you see in like Lord of the Rings or in, you know, the later Middle Ages. Very, very strong, very good at its job. Uh you're not gonna cut through it. You're probably not gonna stab through it even, uh, in most cases. And so swords that are specifically suited towards slashing 
like for example curved swords or uh there's a specific sword called the conda i believe which i might be wrong about that or the pronounce pronoun- enunciation pronunciation mm. one of those words pronunciation um which has no tip at all it's purely a slashing sword even though it's a straight edge which is kind of an interesting choice but we'll ignore that um those swords are not really going to be a thing for the most part um and it wouldn't make sense for them to be a th- uh, you know a big component so if your world has you know an abundance of plate armor uh slashing swords are kind of out uh and even even most straight edge swords that are are good at stabbing I mean, they're going to be more prevalent, but even those are not that effective against plate armor. You're really trying to exploit weaknesses uh, in the armor, under the arm, at the neck, that kind of thing. Uh, which gives rise to a couple of cool uh, sword techniques, let's say, that were used in the Middle Ages and stuff, and, and, and you know, that sort of era. The first of those is called the murder stroke, which I think is a cool thing to say. Uh, <laughs> imagine your sword, right? It's got a blade also known as a handle. I would hope so. As, oh, wait, as this technique would say. I'm, I'm, I'm being silly. Oh, the, the blade is the handle. Uh, I see. I, I'm, yeah, follow me, follow me with this. Okay. So you take the blade, and now the blade's the handle. So you're holding onto the blade with both hands, and you're Ow. using the hilt, the pommel, and the guard basically as a hammer, and you're just going to beat someone over the head with it. Basically turn the sword into a club. You know, wind back the technological clock by 2,000 years and just start beating people up. <laughs> Which actually Jeez. sometimes is the best method to use against someone in plate armor. Because plate armor is really hard to beat, but turns out blunt force trauma is pretty, pretty helpful. Because even if you're wearing a, a layer of metal over your head, even if I can't stab through the metal, I can still hit you really hard and still cause trauma to your head. Knock you out, break your neck. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Give you a concussion. Lots, lots of good stuff. Plus, it's likely that the person with the sword is probably going to be wearing gloves and not going to cut themselves too much. Uh, the... Actually, well, while that is true, the glove material would not really help against the blade. However, uh, it is very, very, I wouldn't say easy, but very viable to hold the blade even with bare hands and not cut yourself on it. it didn't, w- didn't Skull Rim show that one time? I believe you're on the right track, Vito. Gold star. YouTuber guy. Nice. Gold star. (laughs) Uh, The other way to sort of counter plate armor with a a straight blade, again, this isn't nearly as effective, if effective at all, with a curved one. I guess you can murder stroke with a curved blade, but you wouldn't. Uh, The second one's called half sorting. And you've probably heard of this if you're into the... You know, medieval fantasy kind of thing, even though it's not in a lot of pop culture. Or played Uh, uh, Kingdom Come Deliverance. Is it a thing there? That's pretty cool. It's one of the moves you can do, yeah. That's neat. Uh, this is when you hold the handle with one hand still, but now you grab the blade with your other, and basically you shorten the striking point of the blade to about a foot, or le- or maybe a little more, but now you can guide it really accurately with your two hands and try to stab it into the weak points of the armor. Uh, it just makes it a little easier to hit those really specific small places. That's That's a way to beat plate armor um but again armor is really good at its job like it was invented for a reason uh and if those if if you know if that armor that strong is in your world you need to understand that it's difficult to beat and let that inform your decisions about your sword like i said you know don't have a a a fight where uh, someone with a curved blade beat someone in plate armor because that just doesn't make any sense. And it wouldn't make any sense for there to be a lot of rapiers in a world where no, there's no, a lot no, no. Of armored knights. <clears throat> Not for yeah, the most but... part. There's a reason those kind of took over when armor started to fall out of fashion, uh, which is a consequence of gunpowder. But yeah, more on that maybe in a different time. Um, everything has – it's it's very economics, actually, related to economics. Like everything has a relationship to everything else. Oh, and, yeah. You know, it has to kind of all work together to be – to feel real, you know. Well, it leads you to you wonder, like, why were curved blades more prevalent in, like, Middle Eastern countries? Well, it was really hot, and you don't want to wear a ton of plate armor all the time when it's really or, hot. Or even heavy cloth armor. No. So you end up with, you know, lighter armor that's more susceptible to slashing, and slashing is easier, I, I would think, than stabbing is. Uh, and so curved blades are become 
a lot more effective, especially if you're mounted, but more on that a little bit later, maybe. You mentioned also um, a lot of curved swords for uh, pirates as well, because yes, not a I lot did. of sailors wear heavy armor. Right. No, when you're on the high seas, you know, maybe the captain has some, some leather armor, even chain mail. And a lot of pirates might have some chain mail lying around for a battle. Uh, but a lot of them are unarmored. And again, slashing is easier than stabbing if it's going to be effective. And so, you know, get, also your, close, get your cutlasses close, out. Also close quarters. Nice um, curved blades saves a little space. Yes. And it's also worth noting that a lot of pirates would have had straight swords as well. That is, that there's, it's a bit of a, a trope from like Pirates of the Caribbean and stuff that all pirates have these cutlasses that are curved and everything. But, you know, a lot of them were. Although Will Turner used a rapier, I think. He did. I but believe. that's because that was his job. That's true, yes. <laughs> I think he did use a cutlass later on in the movies. Totally, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so, so yeah. what about chainmail? Well, it's surprisingly good at its job still. It's not quite like keeping Frodo alive when the cave troll stabs him. That was, good. That was Mithril, though, John. That was Mithril. Right, I know. I make a good point here. <laughs> uh, it, but it's still pretty good. You can stab through it if you are pretty strong and have good technique and, and hit it at the right blade. place with the right blade. Uh, but unless you got all those things going for you, it's going to be really hard. Uh, and still, uh, hard, narrow, straight-pointed blades are going to be the best thing for puncturing it. Uh, and slashing against chainmail is pretty much just ineffective. Unless you hit it just right at just the right place and it's already weakened and you have a great cutting blade. There's a lot of disclaimers for that. And even so, it's not the best idea. So even if there's just chainmail and it's really prevalent and like whole armies would have it, there's no sense in giving curved slashing blades out. Um, it just wouldn't wouldn't be the right move, and so you wouldn't do it. Remember that decisions about this kind of thing need to be based purely on what's effective and what a real life civilization would do. If it's not the best thing to do to have a curved slashing blade, then they wouldn't do it, even if it looks cool. Or even if you like have a, a specific look you want to go with a specific like culture or race or something like that. Like if yeah. you have your bunch of elves and you want them all to have these curved, like very fancy, you know, Lord of the Rings esque single sided blade thing, you know, swords. You know the, that can be cool, but you know what are they facing? What are they likely to fight? Uh, you need to support their... it with the right surrounding pieces. Essentially, yeah, what's their usual to make it make enemy sense. they fight? What does that enemy usually equip themselves with, and what are they countering yeah. by using the this question... sort of sword? The question needs to be, why do they have this? Besides it looking and being cool. Yeah. Like, that has to be a solid reason for it. Um, so, still, you know, your, your arming swords, like you would see in, you know, your stereotypical fantasy world, those were the norm for a long time for a really specific and good reason. And that was that they're effective against this kind of stuff that was out there. Uh, starting even from, like, Roman times onward. Um, as long as there was good armor, straight narrow blades that could thrust well were kind of just what was good yeah with the exception sense. of things like the zweihander which is again a straight you know sword but it's like six feet long so it's a little I, different i don't think you said that right john it's supposed to be zweihander that's is that's that racist I yeah. no i don't think so okay <laughs> we'll move on uh so moving on a little bit because you know you do want to if you want your curved swords you know you might be asking how can I get that? Well, I'll tell you. Uh, basically, you need very lightly your unarmored opponents being the norm. Whether that's for things like heat reasons, like we talked about with uh, ancient Middle Eastern societies where it was really hot, you wouldn't want to wear a lot of heavy armor. You end up with light or no armor in a lot of cases, uh, You know, depending on maybe a shield to save you, in which case slashing weapons become really effective. Uh, whether it's a technology reason uh, or resources, uh, our armor is more resource intensive than than weaponry, and it's more technologically difficult to make in most cases. Think chainmail as opposed to you know an axe. Axe is a lot simpler and more easy to understand and make than chainmail for the most part. And also, you know, don't you know don't discount cloth armor in your uh, world sure building, things like a gambeson can be very, very effective, very common, much easier to make, um, cheaper, very, very effective versus uh, slashing in particular. Um, there's some good videos online you can look up of people trying to like cut through uh, cloth, good padded armor um, uh, with uh, swords and stuff, and it's actually extremely difficult. Um, yeah, you'd, you'd you'd be pretty good in that, but again, it does take some you know some manufacturing know-how, of course, and the resources yes. to do it. But uh, it's definitely an option. 
Yeah, it is. Uh, but that's kind of what you're looking for if you're trying to get these slashing weapons. And the exceptions exist. You know, there there are certainly examples of mid like middle age, uh, medieval curved weapons, uh, and eastern straight edge weapons. There are plenty of examples of those things. Uh, and but the thing though is is that they are for the most part exceptions. It's not really super normal to have those things when they're not the most effective option. You know, there's, there's a reason why cavalry uh, officers in like the revolutionary war had curved sabers then and not, you know, during middle ages, they didn't have curved sabers Uh, in the revolutionary war. They're riding up on essentially completely unarmored uh, foot soldiers uh, who have rifles uh, and so you just want to get up to them and do a quick slash and they're gone. And a curved saber is great for that. Uh, not so good for bludgeoning a uh, heavily armored knight, uh, which is another factor to it as well. When you have heavy armor, we mentioned the murder stroke being a way of delivering blunt force trauma instead of trying to win in a traditional sense with a blade. Uh, the weight of a blade can play into effect in that as well. If you're fighting a knight in armor, it's nice to have a big, heavy sword that you can whack him over the head with and still do some damage, even if you can't puncture the armor. And that's why arming swords tend to be a lot heavier than your average curved sword, or your long sword's a lot thicker and heavier than, you know, a saber, or certainly a rapier, one of the, like, a really skinny blade. But John, if I were playing D&D, and I were a quick, fast rogue with a rapier, really thin, long blade, and I went up against a knight, in plate armor and a big heavy sword, I would just jump out of the way and, and use my quickness to slash it all as weak points and stab them <laughs> under the arm. That's, I remember very, s- very specifically, I remember you and I were playing GURPS once. GURPS and is we a, were, another role-playing game, by the way. Yeah, it's basically D&D, but different. That's the way I understand it, although I barely understand D&D. Uh, <laughs> and you, we were both like your standard fantasy, you know, 20-something-year-old strong person. Uh, and we were kind of put in a gladiator arena together uh, to fight. I don't think it was to the death, but anyway, we were able before the fight, uh, the fight to choose our own weapons and armor. And I'm like, we're fighting with blunt weapons. If I just put on heavy armor, he can't possibly beat me. <laughs> and I was 100% right. And you had no chance even, because you're like, oh, I'll put on lighter armor and I'll have a little sword. And I'll be fast and effective and you couldn't do anything. And I won. So Super if that, easy. If that tells me anything, <laughs> yes, that, that tells me you should not try that at home. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, so gosh, where was I? Uh, oh, so speaking of that, though, speaking of the idea that limited armor gives way to slashing weapons, there's a reason armor exists, and why just about once it once it was invented, pretty much every society had some kind of armor, uh, and that made these slashing weapons a lot less effective so you need a really good reason in your world why you might not have uh, effective armor and and we're kind of transitioning away from the armor argument to other factors here but you know why why wouldn't you have armor uh is it because of technology like i said is it because of heat is it because you know there are resources uh you need a good reason um so before we transition into sort of the other part of this, and that was the longer part, uh, mm-hmm. do you have any questions that you think people would have? Um, what about bronze weapons, John? What, what, might, what factors might go into a culture having bronze instead of steel swords? Well, since that's what happens in my world, <laughs> um, yeah, so the, the, in my world, that's in, entirely due to resources. Uh, there's just not much iron. It exists, and we know how to use it, but there's not much of it, so most people don't use it because it's expensive. Yeah, uh, like in the real about world, in our money episode yeah, as well. Right. Uh, in the real world, basically, they just didn't know how to use iron yet, and they knew how to use bronze, and so they used bronze, which uh, is why you have bro- the bronze age before the iron right. age. Exactly. Uh, and bronze is cool. It looks cooler than iron, I would argue, which is half the reason why I'm using it in my world, but. <laughs> It does not make as good uh, weapons or armor, mostly because it's softer. Uh, it bends easier. Uh, doesn't last as long. Uh, less effective. Armor is easier to break through. You can probably st- you can stab through uh, bronze plate if you try hard enough, I would imagine. Still not easy, but yeah. Again, for something like that, if you want to use it, you need to have a good explanation for it. Uh, and make sure it's understood why you're using that, because it's not the best option. 
what if I'm just a, a, a nobody farm boy growing up out in the outskirts of a kingdom, and one day I find a dead knight in the road, and I pick up his sword and I take it with me, and then I run into some bandits and try to fight them off with my new sword. How's that likely to go for me? Terribly. <laughs> You'd be better off with an axe. Uh, an axe? You think oh, so? Oh, for sure. Like, if you had a wood cut, a woodcutting axe as your little farmer life, you'd be better off with that. Almost yeah. certainly. Be- you- especially, it'd be better if you had a spear. Yeah, definitely. Do you think it would be uh, take more skill to use a sword effectively as opposed to a spear or an axe? Oh, absolutely. 100%. I say, not knowing the answer. <clears throat> <laughs> no, I, I, I kind of do know the answer, though. No, totally, yeah. <laughs> I've done some research into this because I'm a nerd. Uh yeah, like swords, generally, the, the peasantry didn't really have them, partly because they're expensive and partly because... It was prohibited. It was prohibited. And sometimes, though, it was just better for them to use a spear. Like, there wasn't that much incentive to have a sword unless you had the time and someone to teach you how to use it properly. Um, it was better to have a bow and a, and a spear than to, to mess around with trying to learn how to use a sword properly. And also... Uh, if you don't, if you can't afford like armor and stuff, a spear is way better because you get to keep the distance between you and your opponent. Definitely, I think a spear is one of the most underutilized weapons Absolutely. In, in fantasy literature. Because I mean, it's highly effective, especially if you can have something like one of my favorite weapons for a long time and still is. It was a glaive. The glaive. I know this one. Exactly. Yeah, it's like a sword blade essentially on the end of a long pole. Um, right. Like a, a short sword blade. So it's like a spear, but it's used for like slashing and cutting as well as for stabbing, um, which I always thought was yeah. super cool. Um, but yeah. Like pole arms and spears and like those sorts of pole weapons, I think, are one of the axes too. Axes were heavily used, totally. But I feel like both of those things are usually only used by like the bar, either the barbarian, right, yeah, type, or like a royal guardsman who's got like this plate armor, but also this huge pole axe or you know, cool spear yeah. looking thing. But it's really the foot soldiers and the poor who would really use the spears and the, and the, the axes and that kind of stuff, usually. Yeah, uh, if you were like part of the if you're part of like the main fighting force for an army, you probably weren't using a sword for the most part. At least in most uh, periods a, a spear would be your primary weapon. I mean, the even Romans, the Romans. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we we know them for like their, uh, the the gladius, uh, gladius. Uh, but really they had spears that were used far more often, and that was part of the the thing. Uh, you know, they had those big shields and the spears, uh, and that was a really effective uh, way to way to do business. Yeah. So is what you're telling me. Is is during your your sword thing your your sword explanation? You're telling us not to use swords in our world, John. Is that what I'm hearing? No. <laughs> but no, sometimes they're not the best option. That's what we're saying. No, and and it's important important to point out that they're not the only option by any by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, Brandon Sanderson did that in a cool way, I thought, with Kaladin being a spearman. Um, gets to kind of delve into that a little bit, but yeah. Uh, swords are are really convenient, uh, and f- for a writer, uh, they're, and they certainly were very common. Um, but not quite as universal as some things might lead you to believe. Certainly, yeah. well, cool. Um, I think I only had one more question uh, related to that. Um, as far as maintenance goes, do you know, know anything about how often you might have to maintain a sword, or how you would like? Is I've heard of there being. Um, actually, like oil in the scabbard of some swords, sometimes that you would like put it into, and so it wouldn't rust and that kind of stuff. Like anything related to that that you can tell us that you know uh, if you're if you're writing a scene and like your characters come to a a campsite and they take out the sword and you know try to maintain it or something, what do they actually do to yeah. it? You know, well, if they haven't used it. They're not going to do a whole lot because besides making sure nothing's rusting, everything's dry, uh, and you know everything's fine in that regard. If you've been in a fight, like say. You know, Aragorn fights the Urukai at Amon Hen, and then they start. You know, they pitch camp for a minute before they run off to get Merry and Pippin. In the real world, he would stop and uh, sharpen his blade. He would get uh, a leather strop, uh, it's called, uh, which is essentially a, a piece of leather that helps r- uh, round out the burrs that come up on the blade as you use it. Uh, he would use that on it to get the blade back to its you know proper sharpness. You mean like the little chips and stuff on the edge. Uh, not really the chips. Those are those require more intensive work to 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 get out. Basically, for that you have to grind the sword back to where there are no more chips. Which is why you never strike blade on blade with another sword. If you can uh, if you can help it, you you and it happens inevitably sometimes. But 
Uh, anytime you can help it, you don't do that because it's very, very bad for your sword. Um, but yeah, you would sharpen it, you would oil it, you would uh, make sure it's... I mean, swords properly maintained are sharp enough to like cut hair off your arm. Like They're crazy sharp. Um, it's it's so hard, you, hard to maintain at that level, I'm sure, but... On, like on the road, yeah, you you do your best though. Um, but yeah, you just you you sharpen it, you clean it, you make sure blood's not on it because blood is corrosive. I, that's one of the biggest things that annoys me. It, it, it happens a lot, especially in video games. I think because there's not a lot of time and resources that the developers often have to like add a new animation of them wiping off the sword. But like they'll just have like killed like a million orcs or you know you know soldiers or something, yeah. and the character will just like stick it right back yeah, in the yeah. scabbard covered <laughs> in blood. And say, <laughs> oh no, <laughs> what have you done? It's awful. <laughs> that's a bad idea. Yeah. No, you want to clean all real gross later. Yeah, you got to clean all that stuff out. Uh, oh, it's nasty. Yeah. But yeah, <laughs> uh, those are the things you would do to it just to keep it uh, maintained. Nice. And I'm sure you bring it to the blacksmith and all that kind of stuff every once in a while. Yeah. I, I mean, if you have, if you're, if you can, sure. Yeah. Otherwise, you'd have a wet stone and you try to buff it out as best you can. Is a wet stone actually wet? No, it's W H E T. That's I what believe. I thought. <laughs> I mean, okay. Anyway, and we'll, we'll, making we'll sure do- I'm right. I'm yeah. right. <laughs> Are you checking it on uh, Wikipedia right now? I just Googled it. Okay, cool. <laughs> uh, well, we will have the article up uh, hopefully tomorrow at some point. Um, that's tomorrow, October 30th, uh, 2018. Um, I think we can move on from there. Uh, what do you think, John? Why not? Wine not. Um, Why not? Johnny, that's for you. Wine not. <laughs> Wine get not. It, get, it, get it? Because you don't, you don't drink. Oh, I get it. It's yeah. like you did a thing and now, yeah. It'd be a weird way to respond to that question. Wine not. Not. <laughs> not. <laughs> not. <laughs> okay. Okay. Jeez. Away. <laughs> Meat. Mm. What? <laughs> anyway. We, uh, <laughs> what is going on today? I don't know. I'm in a silly mood. Oh, um, we had a um, um, not the most productive week of writing uh, for both of us, but I did get a little bit done and yes. uh, stumbled across some interesting um, observations slash experience. Well, why um, don't you tell me about those? Well, I will. I was writing yesterday, and uh, this fourth chapter has been giving me a lot of trouble. Um, it's, it's one of those low action moments where basically all I had in the plot was them going and, uh, like talking to a few people to get them to come with them the next day on whatever they're doing. And, uh, it, that's not interesting, you know? <laughs> yeah. So I had to figure out a way to make it interesting. I found some ideas, like I'm introducing a couple new characters in a fun way, um, that I thought of, but... Um, it was kind of blocked when actually writing some of those ideas. So I skipped the fourth chapter, went right to the fifth, which has more of an action Not It's not like an action scene, but they're doing something more specific. Um, they're going on a dive again um, to salvage, uh, salvage a few things, um, plot-related stuff that I don't want to spoil too much, uh, just in case anyone wants to read the book at some point. Um, <laughs> I'm sure things will change, but yeah. But anyway, th- I had b- a better idea, a uh, more specific kind of view in mind. I could see the scene happening in this fifth chapter more than I could in the fourth. In the fourth, you know, you know how when you're writing sometimes you get the impression, you don't get the impression, but you feel like you are the narrator and you can only like see the narrator's words on the page as you're writing yeah. rather than like, it feels seeing the scene dry. and then transposing it onto the page, you know? You just don't see it. Um, you can, it you can feel out. the difference while you're writing. Yeah, definitely. It feels like you're just putting narration down. And, um, and part of that will be, you know, kind of come full circle later in, in a second. But I had a better, you know, I could see the scene in this fifth chapter. So I skipped to it and started writing it. And this, the character that I was going to introduce in the fourth chapter is in the fifth chapter. Um, now that I've made them up. Uh, yes. Because they're going along with this, you know, not quest, but they're they're on, on the ship as they're doing the diving. Right. Um, and so I was writing this character, interacting with the other characters before I'd ever actually had them on in the previous chapter. And I hadn't even introed them. Yeah. I'd, I'd come up with the idea for them and was about to write their intro that I had a few ideas for. But then I skipped that and went to the fifth scene where they've already kind of been interacting with the characters for a little bit. And it actually worked out really well. And I have a better idea now of what I want to do in the introduction for the character because I've seen them interacting with my other characters. 
Oh uh, yeah. As well as you know, just kind of you know having a better flow and kind of got my rhythm back um, in writing the fifth chapter. So and being okay yeah, with yeah. skipping the fourth chapter, which we've talked about before, but I've never actually done it mm-hmm. very much. Um, like we've talked about that as an option, but I've never really tried it very much because I, I still have this block in my head of like, no, I must do it chronologically, you know? Oh, I have to do it <laughs> step by step. <laughs> exactly. And it, th- it made me think that a fun exercise to do this week for both of us would be to skip like, I don't know where exactly, but later on in our stories to another scene that we have in mind. And I know we both have like totally detached plots. from where we are. Ooh, big, big, loud motorcycle outside. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, totally detached from where we are. There's new characters, new stuff happening. Uh, again, we have it in the plot, so we know kind of in a general sense what's going to be happening. But skip to there, write one of those chapters or scenes and see if that gives us any insight into those characters that we can then take back with us to the first chapters and, and kind of infuse those with them. Yeah, um, it might be kind of a fun exercise to do. Yeah, to see for sure. If that helps us out because um, I know we've both kind of hit a little bit of a slower spot right now. Yeah, um, in our in our writing, just because everything's kind of like, I don't know, it's not building the way I want it to at this point. Um, yeah, for me, it's just I've I've it's not writer's block because I try not to call writer's block a thing, but just the last few times I sat down to write, just nothing really is coming out. Just kind of in a slump. Yeah, yeah. And I think we all know how that feels, right? Yeah, and right. This is just one of those things that we can maybe try to get the juices flowing again, you know? Um, that and talking about swords. That's good, too. <laughs> and swords, too. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. And also, I, I was as I was writing the fifth chapter, because I had more, it's kind of a counterintuitive, but because I could visualize the scene a little bit better, I was more okay with it being a little more vague. Like, there wasn't a lot of dialogue. It was kind of like, it almost felt like upon reading it back to myself, it, it almost felt like a summary of the chapter, like a very detailed yeah. summary, but it didn't feel like it was necessarily as in scene as I finally want it to be, like in the moment, you know, um, just in terms mm-hmm. of how it felt. Um, it, it was kind of zoomed out, kind of watching everything happen a little bit, if you know what I mean. But I was kind of right. okay with it because the ideas were coming, at least. Like I, I was seeing yeah, scene something at least, and getting it down on the page, even if it wasn't quite the camera angle that I want to have finally for that for that particular scene, you know. Um, but it was okay because it was just coming out of me, which was great. Yeah, and it, that's how it should should be in a first draft. You know, you're not going to have the perfect yeah, angle. Yeah. You're not going to have the perfect, you know, um, distance from the character. You're not going to have the perfect pacing and that kind of stuff. As long as yeah. you get get it out on the page, you know. Yeah, one thing that I did it, it, while I've been struggling, and it, it was helpful to an extent. I still wouldn't get very far, but it kind of helped me get my footing a little bit. Is like I, I was trying to write this scene, and I kind of knew where I was starting in the scene, but not exactly where it was going. Uh, and I just couldn't make any progress in it. And so I kind of sat back and stopped writing a story and started just writing a sequence of events for the chapter. Like in, in, a, in a very, this happens and then this happens and then this person says this and then this happens and then this happens. Not yeah. putting any effort into like trying to write well or in any kind of interesting way. Mm-hmm. But just for myself to see, okay, where am I, where am I going right now? Like where, where, where do I want to get to and what are the events that lead there? And then once you have that in, in a very micro level for a specific scene, you can kind of go back and then, okay, then Darren walked over, like, and you, then you can mm-hmm, yeah. make it play out in proper, you know, literary language, but yeah. just having something to follow. And I find it very helpful to, when, it, when I do that, when I do the more mechanical kind of like, well, this happened and this happened and this happened for a scene or for a chapter, I find it, I find it better to or I find it easier to fill in the rest of it in a more detailed way if I take yeah. a break from it and then go back to it yes. later. Because you're still in that mode after you've just done that. You know, you're still in that summary technic- technician mode. You're not in, like, prose is flowing out of my fingers Oh, right the now, beautiful you know? prose. Yes. <laughs> um, mm. Those are kind of two different modes for me. Maybe, maybe, I don't know what quite, you know, makes you switch from one to the other, but sometimes yeah. you're in that technical kind of, okay, what's happening now mode. And sometimes you're in that, ooh, I see this scene right in front of me and I'm going to capture yeah. it, you know, kind of mode. Yeah. Well, one, one thing I've learned throughout this, and like I said, you've done more writing than I have prior to this. This is my first genuine long-term attempt at, at this. Um, but writing is such a temperamental thing. It's very much related to like how you're doing, what you're up to. And once you get in a certain headspace, it's hard to kind of break out of it in session. You kind of just have to take yeah. a break from it and, and, and come back because it's just hard to write the ship once you... Like when I, if I start writing and I get discouraged, 
and I am having trouble writing, it's almost impossible for me to break away from that and have a productive writing session just because it's, I can't come back from it and I have to leave and come back later. Yeah. If you're not happy with what you're doing, it's, it's really hard to, to keep yourself going, you know? Um, yeah. and, and if you just feel like, ah, oh, this is, this is terrible. Maybe it is the best thing to just take a break for a little bit yeah. and then come back to it later. Cause that's just not the headspace that's going to get you in the results you want, you know? Yeah. But by the same token, like when you sit down and have a really good writing session where you just, you know, I, I, at the end of my third chapter, I had one where I sat down and wrote 1500 pages in like an hour, or not pages. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I wish, uh, words in like an hour. And it was all stuff I thought was really good and I really enjoyed it. And when that happens, you just don't want to stop because yeah. it's, it's, it feels so good and it's fun to do when it's working properly, but it's just, it's a, it's a beating when it doesn't go well. Yeah. Yeah. I've been, I've been feeling lately like, um, I've had a lot of those days where I'm not seeing the, the stuff happen, you know? Yeah. And I, I wonder if I've just not made the, the story interesting enough or, or, um, like what else could be happening that am I, am I too like married to this idea and I can't like see outside those lines, yeah. um, a little bit. And, and this skipping around thing I think ha- has helped me kind of re, um, breathe some new life into yeah, it. Yeah. Breathe a little bit of new life into it a little bit. Cause uh, I'm, I'm imagining new characters and stuff later on down the road that I hadn't even thought of yet. And you know, if I'm thinking about, uh, I was thinking about a scene that takes place just over halfway through the book and, um, I just had a character pop into my mind and I was like, Oh, that's interesting. You know, that would be a a good person to have earlier on. Maybe that's the scene I'll I'll write this week in, in our kind of experiment and just see what happens. You know, you you could discover new, um, new places, new people, new, you know, all kinds of stuff that kind of fits the, the, the context of that scene that, you know, wasn't even in your head when you were trying to write the beginning. And I can see now a lot better wh- how people could write a book non-chronologically because that, that, that's making more sense to me now, yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, I like that. Especially if you haven't done... We, we did a fairly... No, it wasn't even that in-depth. We, we did like a cursory plotting process before we started yeah, this, but right. it wasn't like we had, you know, minute... Scene by scene. Scene by scene, minute detail planned out. You know, we had a very general... Uh, point by point 27 um uh kind of 27 beat structure going on right. but there's a lot of wiggle room in, in, in oh, that tons. still yeah so yeah i don't know what the proper mixture of that is but we're figuring it out it's a discovery process for all of us indeed and i think yeah. it's going pretty well things considered yeah me too me too i'm having a good time with it um yes yeah, so, so anyway i think that just about wraps up uh that section for this week um tell us about uh um what's the reddit question is going to be for this week john uh, well see the thing is <laughs> my brain is not good oh and subsequently, I forgot to make a Reddit question. Uh, I did. I thought of this, though. Uh, in lieu of a Reddit question, I thought I'd ask you a quick question oh, to no. prompt a, a brief discussion, maybe. Uh, do you, uh, first of all, I guess, are there swords in your world? And if so, do you know what they look like yet? Oh, well, um, that's a good question, actually. That's not something I'd really thought about yet. My, my characters are not adept fighters at this yeah. point. Um which is weird for me because um, most of the characters I've written to this point have been somewhat skilled in some sort of warfare. Um, one That's not c- entirely true. One of them, I'm, I'm thinking, was ex-military, uh, the father character. Yeah. Um, but he's not like a you know a super warrior. He's not a, he's, like a knight or anything yeah, like that. Yeah, he's a decent shot, and they can all throw like a, um, you know, a harpoon pretty well. I'm, 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 at this point, I'm imagining they used to be whalers um, or have worked as whalers at some point. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, swords, as far as that goes, uh, they definitely exist. Uh, this is a early gunpowder technological level, right, um, that I have going So on. armor would kind of be on the way out a little bit. Yeah, there's not a lot of armor. In a traditional sense. Yeah, there's not a lot of armor. Maybe some, like, old French-style curiasses. Is that, is that how you say that word? I think you'd say curious. Cur- curious. Yeah, curious. Um, like the French used to wear, like, even into World War One. Their officers yeah, were that still was, wearing this bright metal shirt. Just by cheers. the way, yeah. in the beginning of World War One, for those, this is a tangent, but I think it's really funny to me. It's not funny, but it's kind of funny <laughs> to me. Like the World War One French soldiers looked like Napoleon's, like soldiers from World War from not for from from Napoleon era, you know, French fighting, early eighteen hundreds. Yeah, they made no changes between then and the beginning of World War One, essentially, to where you have to be an expert to tell them apart. 
And so the officers had these white gloves and, you know, the no helmets and swords, like swords. And they were doing cavalry charges against heavy machine gunfire. Yeah. It was crazy. (sighs) (laughs) I I just felt like I had to tell you that because I think it's incredible. It is pretty crazy. Anyway, carry on. But yeah, so like limited armor, maybe just for the nobility, almost like a ceremonial thing, you know, um, uh, like the rank and file. I mean, this is, there's a rebellion going on. There's a militia force. They have very, very little in the way of, of armor for sure. Yeah. Swords are kind of not a huge thing. Um, I think the main weapons are going to be, um, uh, flintlocks yeah. as well as potentially some, you know, crude, uh, like even like, you know, tool type weapons, like hammers and that kind of stuff. Anything, yeah. anything they can grab as far as like the Royal forces, um, I've not put a lot of thought into what they actually use. I think they're, again, mainly firearms, but the officers in particular definitely will have swords. Um, yeah. It seems and, like you have an opportunity to be able to use some kind of saber, curved sword design. Yeah, it's weird because I'm basing the event that I'm basing the story off of, at least the inciting event, it took place in the 1200s in real life. Um, yeah. But I'm setting the technology level much later, so it's kind of a weird um, mix of things um, at this point. I've not completely reconciled the two yet. But, yeah, it's an interesting question. I'm, I'm thinking mostly yeah. I'll have saber-type swords um, uh, that you th- typically think of kind of in the um, 17th and 1800s here uh, in our world. But mm-hmm. there could be all kinds of stuff still. Um, it's definitely maritime, so there could be some you know, rapiers slash shimitars, um, a lot of different things from different places, you know, depending For on sure. the characters and stuff. But, yeah. What about you? I know you're doing the bronze thing. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't mention this before, but bronze does not make a good, like, long sword. Uh, the yeah. softness of it keeps a long blade from being very good. It just bends, and you can't use it. Yeah. Uh, so, for me, uh, there are steel weapons uh because steel exists it just is uncommon and very pricey so uh if someone is very well kitted out they could have a longer steel sword and have a big advantage uh, and that's certainly going to be the case um it's almost like uh, it's, it, in a sense it's almost like brandon sanderson's thing with the um like whatever magical armor they have in um, shard plate shard plate. That's right. Yeah. Just like, you're so much better equipped than everyone yeah, else. Right. You just like nail everybody. Someone you know? with steel armor and weapons would be like a tank. Yeah. Um, but uh, not so with our main character. He fights with a shield. Uh, it's his sort of primary, like sort of like a Spartan where the shield is the primary focus of a lot of things. Well, Spartans had spears too, but whatever. Uh, but the sword my guy carries is a, uh, st- probably going to be a steel short sword. Uh, so he has a lot of even like maneuverability, a long dagger, uh, long dagger but essentially, uh, but sort of paired with the shield. Uh, and when he's on guard duty, he's going to carry a spear as well. Um, but uh, outside of that, because bronze does not make great swords for the most part, aside from short ones, a lot of the the weaponry is more spears and axes. Um, with sh- with shorter bronze swords and the very occasional steel sword as well, uh, but m- pretty much straight edges. Um, the m- primary armor in my world is uh, bronze scale because uh, bronze doesn't make very good chain mail, but it makes great scale mail, um, which is essentially what I'm using. Uh, and so stabbing is not, or er, stabbing is the better way between slashing and stabbing. So straight straight edges with pointy tips uh, and a lot of blunt force weapons like axes makes sense that's the that's kind of the way i'm going about it nice yeah yeah it's not it's fun to think about this kind of thing it and, is, and yeah. kind of puzzle it out it's not something i've thought of very much at this point because i've, I've kind of just assumed that the main weapons would be early firearms but the thing with early firearms is they kind of suck <laughs> a little bit <laughs> and so not as much as we kind of think usually they're they were not that bad no but they're, you fire once and then if you have somebody coming at you with a blade, the blade you're part. kind of screwed so you, c- you still part. do want probably some sort of bladed weapon. Just like, you know, I'm kind of taking some cues from sort of the Scottish tradition in the, you know, uh, later part of the, um, you know, um, I guess the 1000 to 2000 um, you know, millennium in which they carried uh, three different blades on them for the most part. And there was like the little skin do they had in their sock. They had like a dirk behind them and they also had a sword. Um, so they'll have bladed weapons, even if they have, um, the primary being, uh, firearms. Are you familiar with the Tarj? The Tarj Mahal? Yeah. Okay. We don't, oh gosh. 
No, like it's a Scottish thing. I don't think so. Targe. T-A-R-G-E. It's the little round shield, kind of like a buckler, oh, but it has a yeah, big giant thing. spike in it. Yeah, that thing, yeah. Coming out the tip, coming out the center of it, so it you can stab cool. people with your shield. I really I do. It was super cool. I really do like like the hot Highland basket hilted longsword. Those Bro- are cool. Broadsword, I guess. Those are super cool. Yeah. Yeah, but like the the cloth flaps coming off of it. Yeah, those are pretty neat. Yeah, those are neat. I like those. Anyway, yeah, we should probably uh, go ahead and wrap up for today. Um, why don't you go ahead and plug our. Uh, um, social media, email, that kind of stuff for us. Sure. If you have any questions or comments about the show, email us at wbapodcast at gmail.com. Uh, look for the Reddit question of the week when I actually remember to post it on the World Builders <laughs> Reddit page. Uh, find us there on Reddit at wba underscore podcast. Find us on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter if you're so inclined at World Builders Anonymous. And oh, and leave us a review on iTunes uh, if you like the show. Uh, that's the best way to support us. If you really enjoy the show, uh, subscribe on iTunes and give us a positive review. We appreciate it. Is there anything else? Did I miss anything? I just want to give a quick shout out to our Portuguese listener slash Ooh. listeners because um, we had kind of a bump in downloads for some reason from Portugal recently, um, which was kind of cool. Also, we have our first Italian uh, uh, um, listener, which was super cool. Um, fancy, fancy. Yes, definitely. Um, yeah, we're getting a lot more um, countries popping up on our little our little uh, analytics page. It's a lot page. of fun. Yeah, it's, it's been fun to see which oh. ones pop up. Oh, look for our article on swords at worldbuildersanonymous.com. Uh, that's where the article will be posted. And if you want to read more about swords, that's where you'll be able to do it. That's the one I forgot. Yes. There we go. Nice. Oh, again, and download this episode <laughs> from Stitcher, iTunes, or our website, or anywhere else you find podcasts. But, yeah. I downloaded. Anyway, I don't know. I, yes. I have nothing to say about that. I see no problems here. I see no problems here. Anyway, cool. Thank you for listening, guys. We will see you next week. Bye. This show is sponsored in part by Audible. Visit worldbuildersanonymous.com slash audible to check out what the guys are listening to right now and to receive a free audiobook.